are so glad you are joining us online this morning. No matter where you are, we know you have a ton of options on how to spend your Sunday morning. So thank you for taking some time to spend with us. Our hope is that God meets you where you are today and that you are encouraged by the music and the message that you're about to hear. Hey, if today's service is an encouragement to you, we invite you to partner with us financially to help continue the work we are doing. You can do this in our Cibolo Creek app or by visiting CibeloCreek.com slash give. Lastly, connecting with you is super important to us. And while you are watching, we have a live online host ready to chat with you this morning. So make sure to hop on the comment feed on Facebook, YouTube, or CibeloCreek.com and let us know you are here. Have a great morning, and now, let's worship. Good morning, Cibolo Creek. How are y'all this morning? We're glad to be worshiping with you. Feel free to stand on your feet, whether you're here in this room with us or watching online. Let's worship the Lord together.
And I believe there is one salvation One doorway that leads to life One redemption, one confession I believe in the name of Jesus Christ Crucifixion, by His blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection. Hallelujah, His life is destined. And all praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Not God has overcome.
good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in focused on you and what you have for us. We thank you and we praise you and we give you all the glory, all the honor, Lord. It is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. feel like that introduction I'm hosting a game show or something. <laughs> well, it's good to see all of you. Thanks for being here today. Today is what we call Q&A Sunday, and it's just that, the opportunity for you to ask some questions, and I'm going to do my best to try to provide some answers. And um, it's Q&A Sunday. It's not Stump the Pastor Sunday. That's not really the intent of this. We're looking for questions that will be of help to the broader audience. And um, so we're looking forward to serving you in that way. And I say it this way, you, you can't stump me. And it's not because I know everything or have it all figured out, not even close to the truth. You can't stump me because if you ask a question that I don't know how to answer, I'm just going to tell you I don't know the answer to that. Um, I have no problem admitting my limitations. I'm not here to impress anybody. I'm here to influence. So I'll just tell you if I don't know the answer, maybe what I might do if I have a question that I don't really have a quick answer to is I may just think out loud for a minute or two and kind of show you how I might process going about looking for that question. So um, we're looking forward to serving you today. We had a great first service. Lots of great questions. Lots of tough questions. Uh, they, were, they came to play, so we, we had a good time. Um, let me tell you about why we do this. I believe that wise people ask questions. Wise people ask questions because they're interested in learning and discovering and understanding things better. Now, not all churches are really all that open to questions. They'd much rather just give you an answer and tell you to just believe it and just trust it and do that. And some churches, they associate questions with a lack of faith. And I just, I don't believe that. I think all through the Bible, we see people asking questions. And I think questions are part of the foundation of our faith. So um, we've always decided that questions would be 
welcome here at Civil Oak Creek. 28 years ago when we started this church, that was one of the things I was committed to, was creating a place where people had the permission to ask questions. And so Q&A Sunday, we've been doing it, I don't know, 10 years or more. And um, it's just one of the ways that we model and affirm the value of the permission to ask questions. So uh, that's a little bit of why we do it. Now, here's how it works. Um, in your copy of the creek that you received today, um, there's a QR code. And if you know how your smartphone works, you can just point the camera at that QR code and it'll take you directly to the site where you can just go ahead and ask your question. Now, if you don't have a smartphone and you don't know exactly how that all works with the QR code, um, you can go to um, the um, website address that's in your copy of the creek, slido.com, and then you will type in a number which will identify this event, and then you can, you can ask your question that way. So um, all questions are fair game. There's no question that you can't ask. It could be about the Bible. It could be about faith or spiritual journey. It could be about current events. It could be about the church, like Christians, or it could be about this church, whatever. It could be about family, it could be about marriage. We had a great question in the last service about family and raising kids. So all questions are fair game. Now, we won't be able to get to every question. Uh, just not possible in the time that we have. Uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. I try to keep the answer somewhat succinct, but... Uh, there's some questions just take a little bit longer to explain an answer to. Uh, so you'll submit your question. They'll show up here on this iPad. And then my good friend Wyatt Marchant will uh, sort out the questions. I will. And ask the questions that seem to be uh, most pertinent or most interesting. Um, if you uh, don't have a question, but you look at the other questions, you can actually like a question. And the questions that get a lot of likes will actually come to the top of the list as a way of just sort of us designating what might be of interest to a lot of people in the room. I've asked Wyatt uh, not to go easy on me. No softballs. And last, last service, man, that, there were some tough questions. Mm -hmm. But it was really good. Yep. How about a warm Civil Creek welcome from my friend Wyatt Marchand? Howdy, everybody. What do you want me to do, Bob? Huh? How do you want me to adjust my microphone? Is that better? Thank you, Bob. <laughs> um, so, uh, Wyatt, uh, you said you were 25? 25. Going on 45. Yep. And uh, Wyatt's a good friend of mine. I really, really appreciate his friendship. Um, Wyatt and I, we actually do a podcast together uh, called Civil Oak Creek Conversations. And that's all it is, is us sitting down. He brings some kind of a question or topic, and we just talk about it. Yep. For much longer than most people want to listen to a podcast. Yeah, apparently. Um, so yeah, so any of the questions that don't get answered here, we'll probably end up answering on the podcast. And we don't have a time limit there, so yeah. don't have to worry about it. So questions we won't get to, we'll tackle on the podcast. And, uh, you know, Wyatt and I are convinced that um, our mothers listen to our podcast. His mom and my mom, that may be the only two people that follow us. And my mom's in Pennsylvania, so it's like an international audience, right? <laughs> okay, national audience, but uh, either way, two people listen to it, so they're going to be two of the smartest women you'll ever meet. <laughs> <laughs> so you got that. some questions already lined up? Yes, we do. Um, this was actually a, a big question in the last service, too. Cremation, is it sinful? Oh, I don't know that we've ever had that question before. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. Uh, no, it... It's not sinful. <laughs> I don't. That's interesting that that's a perception that it's sinful. Um, no, I would just say no. It's, there's, there would be no reason why that I can think that that would be some sort of a violation. Um, I, I'm not trying to be crude, but cremation, from my understanding, it re ends up in dust, right? And if we put you in the ground in a couple of weeks or months, guess what you're going to be? dust. Um, so there's a lot of different considerations why people choose cremation. Some has to do with cost and convenience about how we handle um, a, a loved one that's passed. But just simple answer. I, I can't think of any reason why that would be sinful. Um, can't. So short answer. From dust you came to dust you'll return, right? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> where, where's that? It's in the Bible, isn't it? Yeah. 
I think. I don't know. You're the pastor, man. <laughs> All right. Does suicide separate one from Christ? Uh, <laughs> um, no. Assuming that the person who's committed suicide was connected to Christ in the beginning. Was that, did you follow that? So if you're asking if a Christian, and I'm not talking about churchgoer, somebody who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, trusted him for eternal life and salvation. If that person, for unfortunate reasons, and there's always a big story, takes their own life, here's, here's a, the simplest way I'm going to say it, is our salvation... And the security of it is not based on anything that we do. It rests in the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And so it's unfortunate that a Christ follower got to a place where they couldn't see any alternatives, didn't feel any hopefulness beyond the circumstances that they were in. That's unfortunate. That's very sad. But it's, it's, it's not a violation that separates them from Christ. Did you follow that? Now, a person who's not a f believer in Jesus Christ, they're already separated from Christ, so the means of their passing isn't going to impact that at all. Make sense? Okay. Why do some people get miracles and others don't, like when a child dies? Man. Two morbid ones in a row, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, why do some people get miracles? See, I, I guess I would challenge that. Um, truth of the matter is, uh, if we receive salvation through faith in Christ, we're all recipients of a miracle. You get that, right? Salvation is a miracle transformation the conversion of a human soul is a miracle so really I, I wouldn't interpret the question as a miracle why does God protect one in the illustration one child over another child or one family that their child lives and the other family um, yeah I, I, I don't know why God chooses to act some ways as opposed to other ways. And that's all from my perception. My, you know, here I am on earth looking at the situation. We have to understand that God comprehends all of life, all that he's uh, you know, working to accomplish in the world in regards to an entire, what I call redemptive history that began with the creation of the universe and will continue. God's at work and he's doing things and disease and death and deformity, all the impact of sin in the universe, not necessarily that person's sin, but the impact of sin in the universe and the travesty of sin and its impact in the universe is that people die. It, it just happens. And sometimes it happens much earlier than any of us would wish. And sometimes one person succumbs to injuries or illness and they die and somebody else doesn't. And I don't have an explanation for that other than I trust God to always do the wise and right thing in regards to what he's trying to accomplish in life. I, I don't know all that he's working uh, to do in somebody's life through the passing of a loved one. I can't predict that. I can't manufacture that. I can't dictate that. So I, in those, trust me, I've sat in those living rooms with families who's had an infant die. I've been in those hospitals and it's heart wrenching. And I don't have an answer for it, but the only consolation I can give is that I'm going to, by faith, trust God to be at work up to things that I don't completely understand but I have to trust him even when it doesn't all make sense. That, I mean, that, again, there's like 50,000 other things to say, but that's kind of a succinct response. And, you know, again, I, I don't know who asked the question, 
but it's a fair question. And it, you know, we'd like there be a more solid, more defined, succinct answer, but we don't have that luxury. We just don't. In, in our limitations as human beings compared to an eternal sovereign God of the universe, there's just some things that he chooses to allow and permit and that I, I just, I don't have answers for. I don't have an explanation for. All right. Do dogs go to heaven? <laughs> Okay, this is, again, my responsibility is to help you understand the scriptures. So here's what the scriptures clearly teach. Are you ready? Dogs, yes. Cats, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but yes, dogs, of, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Um, in a nation that has, with a weak head of household, how are we to guide our children to faith through the enormous amount of anti-Christ rhetoric in our society today and keep them in faith moving into adulthood from a father of faith raising both young and older children? Read the first line of the question. In a nation of a, with a weak head of household. Mm. Interesting how that was said. Yeah, okay, so the truth of the matter is, I think I can say it, so affirm it. Um, there's never really ever been a time in our nation that you would leave the well-being and the care and the education of your children to other people. You know, we, we, we look back at like our parents' era, or our grandparents' era, and we just think it was so much better, you know. And yes, there were parts of that experience that were richer and fuller because of a number of different values that were still honored and, and trusted in our society. But you know what? They were still having challenges too, okay? Um, so that's just the nature of a fallen society. So... It's imperative that parents and grandparents and family assume the responsibility of doing your very best at providing a healthy environment for your children to thrive, to be actively engaged in what's going on in their life and what's having influence in their life and the experiences of their life. You need to be checked into that. And... Um, it's not a once in every once in a while kind of thing where you swoop in and you know power up and tell them behave. No, I'm talking about developing the kind of culture in your home where you as parents are in a dialogue with your kids about the stuff that they're encountering and learning and seeing and hearing in their music and their movies and social media and at school. And so if you're waiting for a society to help you with that, you'll always be waiting. We had this interesting discussion in the last service. A society, this thing we call society, it is fallen. Okay, it is been compromised by sin in so many different ways that we, to, we are naive to think that a society or even a, worse, a government is going to somehow do a better job with our kids than what God designed for you as parents to do. Does that make sense? Um, what are some of the practical ways? And, and this, again, related to a question that we had in the last service. Uh, I'm going to tell you two or three things real quick. And this may sound like the preacher. Mm, I believe this. Do yourselves a favor. Keep your kids away from social media and the internet as much and as for as long as you can. Don't uh, seriously give up trying to be the cool parent. Or your kids has access to everything. Somebody reminded me after the first service that when you allow your child unfettered access to the internet, you allow the entire world unfettered access to your child. 
And trust me, not all the players in the at, that unfettered access have your child's best interests at heart. So I know, I know my, my wife and I, we raised two boys, so I get it. Like, when do they get a phone and, and all that? And they're going off to football practice and they need to be able to get in touch with me or they're running around with friends or something. And I get that, I get that. But I think long and hard about what capacity that phone has. If you need to give them a phone that they can get in touch with you, give them a kind of phone that is a telephone and not necessarily linked to the internet because in that phone and the permission to use it any way that they want, trust me, they'll find places they shouldn't be or people who shouldn't have access to your children will find access to them. And um, the whole social media thing, it's not what it's portrayed to be. And the people behind it don't have your best interest at heart, uh, your kid's best interest at heart. What they have is their own interest at heart. And if they can get your child addicted to social media, then they're customers for the rest of the life. And they're really looking for the bottom line, and that's profit. And it's amazing what stuff they'll do and how they'll do it to develop that sort of codependency on these apps and these impressions. And... You know, your child flipping through Facebook or Twitter or Reddit or Instagram or Snapchat. Or, I mean, there's just hundreds of them. Your, your child, two things are happening. One is there's some amazing damage that's being amazing. Some very awful damage that's being done to your child's understanding of themselves and their whole self image and who they think because they're going, well, I'm not wearing that and I didn't go to that and nobody asked me to that and it just messes with your kid's mind. And then the whole way in which social media is designed, and again, this, uh, this sounds like, you know, tinfoil hat conspiracy kind of stuff, um, but I'm, I'm just reading about it and seeing it and I see it. This unfettered access to the way that social media works, it's designed, listen to me, you're listening? It's designed to create addiction. It's built on them wanting likes and laughs and approvals and recognition and applause through, you know, the, the app. And that creates issues physiologically, especially in the life of a young person who doesn't have the maturity, the, the um, intellectual spiritual wherewithal to sort out what it is that they're seeing and feeling there's adults who can't even figure that stuff out and they're as addicted to it as they are to as a person can be to cocaine it it has that same okay so <laughs> parents protect your children god gave them to you to provide and protect them be very careful about who, now I'm not talking about living these sequestered lives where we don't watch anything or do anything or go anywhere. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the reckless endangerment that we put our children in when we give them that sort of access to the nature of social media and music and entertainment. So, you know, that, and I said this in the last service. I just can't recommend this enough. This is a healthy habit for healthy families. Make it a priority to sit down once a day with your family and have a meal together. Because it's in the context of that meal that relationships and trust and communication is nurtured to where your child learns that it's safe to talk to mommy and daddy about the weird things that they're encountering at school. And I'm saying have the conversation, learn to listen, quit always trying to discipline, quit always trying to confront, listen to what your child's trying to tell you about what they're encountering. Because when you judge them or you, um, you confront them and you don't listen to them, they're learning mommy and daddy are not safe to talk about these things. So where will they find to talk about them? Well, they'll talk with their friends, and their friends are in the same conundrum that they're in. Or they'll end up talking to people that they don't even know who live in Thailand because they found them on the Internet. And you don't want that. 
So create a place in your home where you're sitting down with your kids and you're having conversation about the stuff that's going on in life. Mom and dad, share what stuff you're encountering in, in your life and show them that it's safe here to talk about it. And I know it gets harder. It gets harder as they get older. It gets harder when they get a car and they can kind of go, come and go as they please. But man, if you'll develop the priority of us sitting down together and having a meal as a family, it'll go a long way to providing some of that context for your children to be safe in a world that's, that's a bit at times out of control. Does that make sense? And you say, but my kids are growing up now. You can still have conversation. It's not too late. Never too late to prioritize family. All righty. Here's a softball for you. And it softball. Kind of, it's not. I lied. Um, <laughs> it kind of goes in line with a lot of the different things going on in Israel, but, uh, and I guess all over the world, but primarily Israel. The question is, are we living in the end times? Is this something you might teach on soon? Uh, Easy, easy answer. Yes, I will speak on it soon because you guys are asking a lot about it. And <laughs> it seems to be of great interest. Um, I'd not say I'm going to talk about it next month. So be patient. Um, we, we are on a plan of some other topics that are priorities right now. So um, here in a couple weeks, we're going to start a new series on the topic of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not going to just turn a blinker and make a hard left. I'm sticking with the plan. Uh, but yes, now I forgot the question. Um, so yes, uh, what was the first part? Of the are question? we in the end times? Oh, I, I don't believe we are. I don't believe we are. And here's why I'd say that. It depends on how you use the term the end times. The scriptures use the, the, the thought or the idea of the end times as a very specific biblical period of time on a timeline that God is on about what he's trying to accomplish on this earth in relationship to human beings. So like I was sharing with you last Sunday, I, I think the very next thing to happen, prophetic future, I don't know when it's going to happen. I will tell you this, it's going to happen like that. It's described as a blink of an eye. So it's not like you're going to have a couple weeks notice to sort of get your act together and get ready, get all packed up and standing on the curb. It's going to happen like that. It's the rapture where Christians, Christ followers are, will leave this earth. And then again, if we're going to be strict in the terms, the end times will begin. God's work in the life of the people of Israel that was interrupted at one point in history, God will pick up and continue. Strictly speaking, that is the end times. Did you follow that? Okay, now here's, here's what I will say. God started a work in the life of the nation of Israel. You may recall this graphic from last week's message. God started a work in the nation of Israel. It got interrupted, if you will, when they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And then God does a different work. He, he makes the gospel available to all human beings, Gentiles and Jews, the work of the church or the period of the church. That's going to come to an end at the rapture and then the end times will begin. So this chasm, I don't, I don't have my graphic with me. I, you guys are imagining, imagining this being the era of the church. God's been doing that work since Acts chapter 2. And we're moving throughout history. Here we are 20 centuries later. So in effect, we're coming to the close of that time. I don't know when, but, you know, time's passed. So that era is getting shorter. And naturally, as society devolves... We're seeing a lot of concerning kinds of concerning kinds of things or disconcerting kinds of things that are descriptive of the end times. We're seeing that now. Are we in the end times? I, I wouldn't say that strictly speaking. I just say the evidence is lining up that perhaps this period of time is coming to some close soon. Now, 
um, what do you call the people who dig the holes in the ground and start collecting water and food? Ah, uh, I don't know. The prepper. Oh, oh, yeah. pre oh, okay. Yeah, a prepper. No, I'm, I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that. <laughs> These are all the things that we have to worry about as preachers. If I say this, people will think that. I, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it appears as though there's lots of things happening in our society and happening in our world and happening in our nation that suggest things are not going in a good direction. That's, that sets the groundwork or that sets the stage for much of what we know to be true of the end times. Does that make sense? Okay. Better give me another question. All right. Would you consider teaching one book of the Bible at a time over the course of a year or so? I'd be interested to really dive deep into scripture as a church family. Yeah, great question. A um, couple of responses. Uh, you are welcome to study one book at a time and dive deep into it. It doesn't have to be here. Okay, you, you can do that in groups. You can do that with yourself. I have been personally considering just as a different approach to how we go about things that occasionally doing a study of a book of the Bible. I'll just tell you straight up, we're not gonna spend a year doing it. Hmm. There's this thing called on-ramps. Um, it's a way audiences participate in things. And if we went uh, 52 weeks on one topic, then anybody trying to get in at like week 30, they're like, I, I feel lost. They're trying to catch up. So a way that you serve an audience is that you have frequent on-ramps. So we've typically done topical um, messages four, five, six weeks so that anytime somebody jumps in, they're not gonna, it's not going to be another 50 weeks before they can be a part of the conversation or feel left out. Can I say something really specific? Can I say something very specific? It's all you. <laughs> It's just a little, uh, little um, thing that bugs me. There, there tends to be this thinking in the church, not this church, but like the church in general. There's like topical preaching, and then there's this thing called exegetical preaching. And some churches say, this is the right way to teach. This is the wrong way to teach. And I go... That's interesting because the only messages that we have of Jesus were topical. And exegetical preaching is not a way of preaching. Exegesis is a way of studying. So when I do topical messages, I use exegesis. I'm using the rules that guide how you study the scriptures, how you interpret the scriptures, and how you teach the scriptures. That's called exegesis. I do that Anytime I open the scriptures, I'm using exegesis to better understand and describe what it is that I've learned. If I did a book study, I would be using exegesis. Exegetical preaching is a way of preaching. It, it, some people do it, but it's not the better way or the only way. I, that's just a little soapbox. Sorry. <laughs> I'll come back here. All righty. When discussing abortion with a non-believer, how would you answer the question, if God cares about the unborn and doesn't want babies killed, why did he kill the firstborn in the Exodus story? Hmm. Okay. Good question. Interesting. Um, well, two things I'd say um, right off the bat. There's a big difference between the permissions that God has and the permissions that I have. If God chooses to take a life as the author of life, he has that choice. I'm not him. We're not him. We are not him. We have instructions from him that we are to treat life as sacred and valuable. That's not to say he doesn't treat life as sacred or valuable, or valuable, but he's just at a different plane of the discussion than we are. Our instructions are to honor life, to support life, to give life. That, that's the nature of what it is that we to do. 
that we are to do. So for me to make a decision or a person to make a decision about ending another human being's life, that's a different discussion than God making that decision. So I that set that here and then come over here why God chooses to sacrifice in sacrificial system why um, the firstborn that are being sacrificed was never a child it was an animal big difference in terms of eternal value I'm not anti-animal. I'm just saying you can't put human beings in the same category as animals. So the sacrifices that we see of the firstborn in the Old Testament are not human beings. They are animals. And the reason why a firstborn animal was selected is because it had the most value in the market. And so God was asking Israel that when you make sacrifices to me, I want you to sacrifice what has the most value to you as a way of demonstrating that he has the most value to them. So please be very careful about the firstborn that was sacrificed in the Old Testament. That was an animal always, not a child. And in there are some evidences in the Old Testament where other cultures, other civilizations were in fact sacrificing children as part of their idol worship and God condemns it. So it's, it's not even, we're talking apples and oranges in firstborn. Did I, did I understand the question correctly? I think specifically he was talking about the plagues whenever they were in Egypt okay. and how the children did die on that occasion. Yeah. Yeah, okay, the, I, okay, good. Um, here, again, God determining things versus me determining things. Um, I, I would, I'd say that was designed to basically demonstrate, in the context of the plagues, that was designed to demonstrate, don't mess with God. He's not to be trifled with. He's serious. And when he gives instructions and commands and he gives directives, human beings are wise to do exactly what he says. And if you don't, the consequences are severe. And in that case, if you remember, that's the 10th plague. God had gone through 10 other iterations of really serious consequences for Egypt. It, the, the, the head of Egypt yeah, the Pharaoh. Thank you, Rick. Uh, the Pharaoh ignoring the instructions of God to let the people of Israel go. They'd been through lice and frogs and water that turned to blood and locusts. And God's like, I'm <laughs> okay. Here it is. This one's if those didn't hurt and they did this one, this one will hurt deeply. And if you'll remember, that's really there, there wasn't the 11th plague. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, that was like, okay, okay. Evidently, he's serious about this. Again, I don't know if that's, you know, in our popular culture and society, if that's an answer everybody's going to love or embrace. I'm doing my best to try to put it in a context in relationship to God and us as human beings making those sorts of value judgments about life. All right. All right. How would you approach the subject of faith and eternity with ailing grandparents who seem uninterested in the subject? How would I approach the topic? Um, first, I'd approach it prayerfully. And I'm not assuming by the question that you're not praying. Probably out of compassion and love, you are praying. Please open their hearts, open their minds to understand the invitation of Jesus for salvation. So that, um, lots of prayer, ample doses of love, showing them your love and your concern. Don't make them understanding the gospel, the, the one and only demonstration of your love for them. Maybe it's supporting them, coming around them, helping them, you know, show them love, not just make them a project that you got to, you know, 
get them to understand this. And then have the courage to very thoughtfully and respectfully bring the subject up. Have the conversation. And it probably isn't a one-time thing. It's, it's developing a rapport and a, a, a trust with them to where you can bring the conversation back up again and again. Talk about it. Don't be obnoxious with it. But the truth of the matter, at the end of the day, that person makes a choice about what they're going to accept to be true. Like I told you the last two Sundays, we all live by faith and we all assume the risk of the faith that we choose. And a person who assumes that I don't believe in God, I don't buy the Jesus thing, I don't believe in the urgency of what the scriptures teach about putting my faith in Jesus Christ, that is a decision that that person makes and then they assume the risk of that decision. And with your heart and with all your compassion, you do your best to try to share with them in creative ways this, this conversation about Christ and his offer, but you, know, you just have to be prepared that they might not accept. And you, you are not a failure for the choice that they make. And, you know, sharing faith is a, it's, it's a conversation. It's, Grandma, would you read this book? I really found this book to be valuable. Would, would you read it? Or, or it's just like, Grandma, would you, Grandpa, would you watch this video? I thought this guy had a really interesting perspective on this. I found it helpful. Would you listen to it? So it, it can come from a variety of different ways or pers um, uh, approaches, but have the conversation. I, I, again, I've, I've been at this for a while, so I, I kind of see some of the things that we do is we go, well, I'm just praying, I'm just praying, I'm just praying, I'm just praying. Well, have you ever talked to them about Jesus? No, I can't do that. I, can't. I, I don't know. They're, they're going to ask me questions, and I don't know the answer. And it, they told me I wasn't supposed to bring it up. And, and so I'm just praying, I'm just praying, I'm just praying. And meanwhile, I think God's saying, okay, I, I heard the prayers, but perhaps I'm at work in your life too through this potential loss and I'm maybe inviting you to step outside of your comfort zone and learn to share to talk to your grandparent about this very important issue of life all right why was God so mean in the Old Testament they added the quotations not me yeah in the Old Testament especially in contrast with the love of Jesus in the new yeah uh, and that is such a popular perception God's God's ornery and grouchy and mean in the Old Testament. Jesus, he's so loving and kind, and he, he carries sheep on his shoulders. I mean, how do you not love a guy like that? Um, here's the deal. John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and then we find out, you read verse 14, and the Word became flesh, and He dwelled among us. And so the Word that John's talking about is Jesus. Verse 18 of that passage, no one's ever seen God, but Jesus explains Him to us. He, in fact, the Word there is He embodies everything that God is. So we actually learn what God is like through Jesus. Did you follow that? So we, we understand what God is like through the life of Jesus. And what we understand from Jesus is that everything that we love about Jesus' love is true of God. Everything that we learn about Jesus' kindness and compassion and, and servant-heartedness is true about God. Um. The, the reason, I think, the reason why we see such... A, well, here's the deal. If you, read the, if you read the Old Testament fast, or just a little, you're going to see a mean God. Because you're just going to hit all the highlights. And you're going to think, that's God. But if you spend time really s studying and getting to know the Old Testament scriptures, what you realize is that God is an amazing loving, compassionate, faithful father, particularly to the people of Israel. He he's, just goes overboard trying to provide for them. And when they refuse for him to provide for them, then at times he gets tough. So if you read the Old Testament slowly, God is not grouchy and he's not mean. He's a loving, 
father who at times does hard things because his children need hard things in order to learn what he wants them to learn. And the truth of the matter is that some of the times, some of the things that we see about Jesus is that he was tough and he was direct and he said hard things. It, it's just that it's interesting how it plays out. Jesus says all the hard things to the most spiritual people. And he says some of the most kind and compassionate things to people who are the furthest away from God. Jesus' most harshest, uh, most harshest, Jesus' harshest words, they were said to the Pharisees who should have known better. But Jesus had to cut through the, the crap in order to say, you need to hear this. This is the truth. And so... Um, Jesus could be just as a tough customer as sometimes we acquaint with God. And I'll just tell you, going back to last week's message, that, you know, Revelation chapter 20. Someday when all human beings stand before Jesus as judge. I tell you, he's going to be tough. He is going to seem unmerciful and he's going to seem um, inflexible and he's going to seem very harsh because that's part of who and how he is as the righteous holy judge who's also a loving compassionate savior that's all combined together in the one person because that's what God is like make sense all right. how are we doing on time we got two Good. minutes 10 so. 15 minutes yeah exactly <laughs> using your time um <laughs> Here's a fun one for you. As a Christian, how do I respond to a wedding invite to a marriage between two women or two men who are my family members? Yeah, yeah, good, good question. What's the next one? <laughs> <laughs> There's no more, it's the last one. Yeah, so, so, um, remember Jesus who embodies God He's described as being full of grace and truth. Like he's the perfect combination of all things that are true and all things that are gracious or graceful. Like he wasn't one or the other. He was truth and grace combined together. Do you get that? So we're talking about the instructions that we have to love we are to love all people. And so in the situation of like a family wedding or friends wedding, we can be loving toward family members by attending a wedding. That doesn't mean that we have to adjust our understanding that that arrangement of a wedding is contrary to God's design and he's not approving of it. And this, you know, th this is the invitation to wisdom. Uh, I love wisdom. Wisdom's like my favorite thing. If it can be anything in life, I want to be wise. And wisdom is a lot about you're trying to do the right thing in difficult situations trying to know the right thing to do. I love it. And I think it's Proverbs, which is all about wisdom. I think it's chapter 24, verses 4 and 5. Don't quote me on that. I think I'm guessing there. Uh, Proverbs 24, verse 25. Like, there's this verse, and it says, answer a fool. And the very next verse says, don't answer a fool. And you're just like, what? Yeah, see, sometimes it's wise to speak up, and sometimes it's just wise to be quiet. And a wise person has to navigate what situation am I in? What would be the wisest thing to do right now? And so it's possible that we look at a wedding that God does not approve of, a marriage that God does not ordain or bless. It's a contrary to his design. And I'm trying to figure out what's the wisest thing to do. And that's usually the challenge of wisdom. It's never easy. If you think it's easy, then you're not really in wisdom territory. Okay, so you, you have to decide. And, and here's a factor. I'm not saying you have to agree with me. Here's a, a factor. 
by attending the wedding, not giving approval of it. And you say, well, that my presence there approves it. Not necessarily. My attending the wedding provides the relational, um, the relational clout <laughs> to be able to continue to speak into those people's lives. Whereas perhaps my not attending the wedding, I've now severed any kind of, you know, relational um, wholeness. And now they'll have nothing, they'll listen to nothing I might have to say. And, you know, every situation's different. The truth of the matter is every situation's different. Like wisdom is like, do I go, do I not go? And it's, it's, it's different. I, I would counsel a person, yes, go. That doesn't mean that you can't speak to, and I'm not saying at the wedding, I'm just saying speak to the fact that I'm sorry, but I don't, I don't believe that your marriage honors God in its design. You, you can have those conversations. Don't do it at the reception. <laughs> I'm assuming you knew that. Um, but you can have those conversations, but not going, maybe in some situation, again, maybe in some situation, this, this is wisdom, like, oh, no, no, no. If, if a, couple's, a couple's being very belligerent about their arrangement, and they're sort of throwing it in your face, then maybe it's wise not to go. It all depends on so many variables. But I'll, I'll tell you this, anytime you act in love will always be a good thing and don't mistake acting in love as giving approval it's not always one and the same thing you say well Paul your answer didn't help me one bit I know <laughs> that's the nature of wisdom you're gonna have to whoever asked that question you might have to prayerfully consider maybe have a conversation with some other people who would be helpful to get their perspective and think through what what do i say by not attending the wedding what, what am what am i doing or what what do i what am i saying by attending the wedding and if the higher value of love and um building some sort of a future rapport to have a conversation with the people that you love um, your participation may be uh, merited. We're out of time. We're out of time. We are. And there's still 97 questions. <laughs> we got to what, eight? Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Okay, so again, as Wyatt described, uh, he and I will put these in a list. These are topics that we'll pursue in our podcast together. And um, maybe you'd be interested in joining our podcast. Otherwise, his mom and my mom are going to be two of the smartest people on the planet because they will have uh, listened to what we had to say. Well, thank you guys so much for this. Um, thank you for being good sports about it. It's not something we do every Sunday, of course, but we do it from time to time, and we hope it's been helpful. All righty. Let me ask you to stand together. And while I have you standing and giving me your undivided attention... Would you please remember that next Sunday is Serving Sunday. And we have a wonderful opportunity to make an impact in our broader community. But the important thing that I want to get in your heads before you leave here is that next Sunday, we start at 9 o'clock here in the auditorium. So please be here at 9, not 9, 9 30. Okay, 9 o'clock. We'll meet here. We'll have sort of a a time of prayer together and then we'll all move out into the different projects. If you haven't signed up for a project, I think there's still a couple projects we could use some help with. And so stop by our website and check them out. Make sense? Yes. You guys are awesome. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much that you've invited us to come to you with our questions. That you understand the nature of our limits the nature of our curiosities, the nature of the things we just don't understand. And so we thank you, Father, for the permission to come and ask questions. And I pray that you'll continue to cultivate that sort of a culture here at Cibola Creek. It'll always be a place where it's safe to come with your questions. Father, thank you that there's, there's really so many wonderful answers contained in the, the revelation of the scriptures that are so helpful to us if we'll pay attention, if we'll understand them thoroughly and do our very best to apply them. 
in the ways that we've sensed your spirit leads us to do that. So, Father, I just pray that you continue to guide each of us in all the different complexities of the situations that we have in our families, in our home, in our jobs, in our schools, in our community. Help us to be the kind of Christ followers who are loving and wise. And I pray and ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, everybody, have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.